Thank you, Auntie Kailani, for a meaningful beginning to our symposium this evening. My name is Leighton Taylor. I'm a volunteer with Malama Monlua, one of the organizers of tonight's symposium. Uh, I have a lot of thanks to make, but one of them is to Malama Monlua for allowing me to be a volunteer in marine science and marine conservation, which is something I've been had a lifelong interest in. I would like to thank you for coming out on a Saturday night in, with only less than three weeks shopping days till Christmas, so I'd like to commend you two on ordering your priorities properly. Tonight's first speaker is Dwayne Minton from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Dwayne uh, is a marine scientist and a marine uh, uh, data and analyzer who designs wonderful systems, some of which Mona, Malama Monalua uses, a protocol that our volunteer scientists use to assess what's happening with the uh, invasive algae in Monalua Bay. And uh, Duane had spent many hours, and still spends many hours, even though his base is now in Oregon, uh, working on the reefs of Monalua Bay. So, uh, Please welcome Dwayne Minton, who will tell us, or at least ask the question, where have all the fish gone? Uh, thank you, Leighton. Um, I want to thank uh, Malama Manalua for um, accommodating my schedule. As Leighton kind of let slip, I'm not actually based in Hawaii anymore, so please don't hold that against me. Um, I have spent a lot of time in Mauna, uh, Manalua Bay. Um, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the, with the reefs and so forth. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about fish in Monolua Bay. Uh, about three years ago, I presented some information on reef fish in Monolua Bay um, in, a in a symposium almost just like this. It was in a slightly different venue, but Alelo was here. And I recognized some faces that were here three years ago. Uh, and in that presentation, I gave you guys some very um, kind of somber news, I guess. Um, I bet you're hoping I can stand up here today and tell you that everything has kind of turned the corner and everything is looking really good and uh, we're on our way back to abundance in Monolua Bay with our fish. Uh, unfortunately, I can't. Now, I know I'm not supposed to give away my punchline before the end of my talk, um, particularly when the punchline's not really all that funny, um, but I'm hoping that what I have to say today will inspire uh, you guys in this room who can then move on to inspire the community uh, to make some positive change uh, out in the bay itself. Monolua Bay has historically been known as a place of abundance. Uh, many of you in this room today uh, know a Monolua Bay that had a lot of fish at one point uh, and had healthy reefs. And over the past, oh, I don't know, maybe three, four, five decades, uh, that, those conditions, those fish, the reef itself, have all been in a steady state of decline. Since about 2007, the Nature Conservancy uh, has been conducting assessments of fish in Monolua Bay to determine their condition and their trend. Uh, basically, we've been asking the question, what, what do the, the, the reef fish in Monolua Bay, Bay look like currently, and are they getting better or, or are they getting worse? Today, I'm going to present some of those findings from um, about five or six years' worth of work that we've been doing here. Uh, first off, I, I, I want to I, I be really clear that um, the data I'm going to talk about today is intended to cover the entirety of Monolua Bay. Um, I'm sure there are people in this room who can go out into the bay, take their boat out, 
and they know those secret little spots where they might be able to find a lot of fish. Um, but that's not what I'm really looking at here. What, what I'm looking at is uh, the trend across the entire bay uh, and the conditions across the entire bay. Now the Nature Conservancy uh, Marine Monitoring Team uh, has conducted five uh, surveys, well five annual surveys uh, within Monolua Bay uh, and in those five years we've visited and counted fish at um, approximately 200 different sites across the bay. Uh, so this is a, a fairly large uh, data set. Um, we use standard survey methods uh, when we are in the water and these are survey methods that are used all across the state of Hawaii uh, by a whole bunch of different researchers uh, and they're actually used all across the Pacific. Uh, and one of the nice things about that is it allows us to take our information that we collect in Manalua Bay and compare it to other areas in Hawaii. Uh, and that's going to be really key for some of what I show you and, and, and some of the questions that, that we're interested in. Uh, at each of our survey sites, we go out and we count and we identify and we estimate the size of every single fish that we see uh, within our sampling area. Uh, and so we're, we're counting everything out there, from the smallest little gobies to the biggest jack that happens to swim by. Uh, we can then take that information and we can convert it into fish weight. Uh, and weight is really the, the, the best way to describe uh, how much fish is in, there, in an area. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. If we take those five survey time periods that I mentioned up there previously and, and we just plot them um, by the year, so we have uh, the year along the lower axis, and then we have the total fish biomass. So that's a total fish weight um, and, uh, for each given uh, survey time period. And that's the total fish weight in Manalua Bay in general. Okay. Uh, what we see here is that these numbers go up and down. Um, it's got very wide little bars. If you see those little like whiskers um, on my dots there, um, that's a, a measure of variability. And so what that's telling me is that um, uh, you, you go to one site and find a, you know, quite a bit, maybe go to another site and not find all that much. Um, but the dot itself is, is the average. And if you notice, the average kind of bounces around a little bit, um, but there appears to be no trend uh, within, uh, within the bay um, during our sampling period. Um, so it doesn't look like the, the, the fish are either increasing or decreasing. Now, that may be good or that may be bad. Uh, if you've already got a lot of fish, um, that's great if it's holding steady. If you don't have a lot of fish, that's, that's not so good. You'd rather see that trend going up. Um, so there's this weight number down the side there, which is probably pretty meaningless. Does, do, does that, is that a lot of fish or, or not? Well, one way we can get at that is, is we can compare the amount of fish we find in Monolua Bay uh, to other sites in Hawaii. Now, this is kind of a complicated figure. Um, I know some of you have seen this figure before, something very similar to it. Um, but I'm going to walk, walk through it really quickly. Uh, what we have on that y-axis uh, is, 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 again, the, the total fish biomass. Uh, and that is in grams per meter squared. Um, so all you guys got to break out your little calculator, grams, pounds, how's it all work out? Anyways, it's, it's, a, it's a measure of weight um, per unit area, just to standardize everything out so we can compare. Each bar uh, represents the average amount of fish um, at a given site in Hawaii, and those sites are listed along the bottom. Now, some of you in the back may not be able to read the small type down there wondering where Monolua Bay is. Um, I can actually highlight those out for you. Those, those three bars uh, represent the three of the sampling years uh, that we did in Monolua Bay where we collected data that was directly comparable to the other data set. Um, as you can see, that's all the way on the left side of the figure. Um, the easiest way to put this is the left side of the figure isn't where you want to be. Um, you want to be on the right side of the figure. Uh, those are the sites that have all the fish in them. Unfortunately, Manalua Bay, all three years worth of sampling that we've done in there um, fall all the way to the left. Um, so that's some of the bad news. Now this is looking at all the fish. So this is the total fish uh, in Manalua Bay. So how, how much is there? We can uh, break that down and look at something called target fish. Now um, target fish are are um, a selection of fish um, that occur across the state that are particularly prized um, and are thus fished rather heavily. So these are things like, um, a couple of pictures up here, um, things like some, some of your surgeon fish, um, some of your red fish, uh, some of your veke and your uhus and you know all these things that people like to eat. Um, and so these are, are, are those target fish. And um, I'm spending a little time here because we're going to see these target fish again a little bit later in my talk. Um, but something we notice is that, the, is that the pattern is exactly the same as, as it was with, with all the fish. 
uh, Manalua Bay's three bars are kind of sitting way down on the, on the wrong end. Um, so that's, that's certainly not, not great news. So we can see that the condition of the reef fish in Manalua Bay um, isn't all that great when we compare it to other areas around the state. Um, and it isn't that great compared to what it, what it was probably even 20, 30, 40 years ago. So what, what can you do about it? Well, if you're going to try and solve a problem, first you've got to identify the cause of that problem. Um, there are a lot of potential stressors that are affecting uh, the reef fish in Manalua Bay. Um, Manalua Bay, uh, over the past 50 years, um, the population, the amount of development um, have skyrocketed uh, along the shores of the bay. Uh, that has changed the way the land and water uh, interact. Um, we now have more people, more dirt, more nutrients, more chemicals. Um, you can name any number of things uh, that are potentially bad that are uh, crossing into the waters of Montelo Bay and are affecting um, not only the reef but the associated fish on them. So how do you know what to address first? Um, well, that's part of what, what you have to figure out is which of these stressors are important? Um, which of these stressors can we potentially take on and correct? Um, what is the timetable or time scale for actually doing those things? And how do we do it? Um, I just have a couple of old historic pictures here. Um, I'm not sure the exact date on these. I, I pulled at least one of these off of Malama Manalua's website, so they may have a good idea. But um, these are pictures of, of the um, Manalua Bay area. Uh, and you can see that there's very, very little development on it. This is um, obviously pre-1960s. Uh, in the 1960s is when most of the development started out in the kind of Hawaii Kai area. And, and, and you can see some of these buildings being built up now. Uh, and currently, it's a, a lot of concrete um, at this point. Now, I, I, I come back to this figure um, because there's, there's actually a lot more information in this figure than I led on initially. Um, I'm fairly confident after looking at, uh, at our data, our TNC data, uh, that the most significant effect on the fish population or the most significant impact on fish populations right now is harvest. Um, and I come back to this figure because um, I can pull a little bit more information out of it. If I overlay um, fishing management regimes um, over this bar graph, and what we have here are um, areas that have the highest level of management, um, which are the state MLCDs. Um, we have areas that have um, sort of an intermediate level of management, which are um, fishery management areas or replenishment areas. Uh, and then we have areas that are open, which have um, the, the basic state um, fishing regulations. Um, the, the three bars from um, Manalua Bay would, would ordinarily be green on here, but I've left them yellow so that they stick out. And, and you know, immediately what you notice is that um, all those red bars are off to the right. All of our green bars are kind of trailing off to the, off to the left. Um, now, being the very perceptive and astute audience that I know all of you guys are, you're looking at this and going, well, hey, wait a second. What if all those reefs on the right are just, just happen to be really nice reefs? Um, you know, we put MLCDs in really nice places, don't we? So those just mean, those are great reefs. It, it can't be related to fishing. Well, you know, that's, that's a great question. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you a, a couple more pieces of evidence. We can take a look at our fish, and we can pull out what are called non-target fish. These are fish that are not heavily fished in Hawaii. Uh, these are like small damsel fishes, um, some butterfly fish, a couple of the really small wrasses. But there's no appreciable fishing on them. And uh, if we look at the amount of those fish across management regimes, as we do here, um, we actually see that it's, it's constant. There's, there's, um, there's no difference. If we go back to our target fish, um, we, we now see, um, again, this, this difference between managed areas um, and, and more open areas. Now, these fish live on the same reef. They experience the same type of habitat, the same water quality. They're counted the same way. Um, the only difference between these fish are the target fish are fished for and the non-target fish are not. Um, we can actually use um, some of this data to look specifically at Monolua Bay. Uh, and for target fish species, if Manalua Bay was to improve its management of fish um, in the bay, that alone could provide as much as a four times uh, or four times more of an increase um, than if you were to manage all of the other stressors in the bay. Um, fishing has that much of an impact, um, particularly on target species. 
Um, so if you wanted the largest bang for your buck, um, it would be to um, implement some additional fishing management. Now, I want to be very clear that um, all of these other stressors that I mentioned earlier are very, very important. Um, and this is by no means the talk that's saying you ignore those. Um, what I'm saying is that your largest gains to your target fish population uh, will come from improving your fisheries management. Now, this is all kind of gloom and doom news a little bit, I guess. Um, but, there, but there is a little bit of a silver lining. Actually, let me back up a little bit. That's a wonderful picture of one of our fishermen. Um, but uh, there, there is kind of a silver lining in here. Um, fishery management is, is something that is um, attainable. Um, it's certainly not easy to do and requires a considerable amount of political will. But when you compare it to, say, um, taking the concrete linings out of channels uh, and tearing down houses because we've, we've had some poor planning and placement of you know, roads and houses, um, it, it actually looks a lot easier to do than those things. These things require a whole lot of political will and millions upon millions of dollars to make happen. Um, fishery management doesn't. Now, um, managing fisheries uh, is achievable and it is tricky. There's a wide uh, toolbox that's available of various techniques uh, that will allow you to uh, implement ways to improve your fish stocks. Um, exactly what, uh, what of those various tools you pull out of a toolbox is always a, a really good question. Um, that's a question that the people of uh, Monolua Bay need to get together uh, and discuss sooner rather than later. Um, and you have to do it sooner rather than later because this is a long and challenging road. Um, but it is one that, that can be successfully traveled uh, and there are some other communities in the state that are um, a little bit further down the road from you guys. Um, but I'm confident that, uh, that this community can do it. And the reason I say that is, is, is I look back at, at, um, uh, at the invasive algae clearing project that was conducted here uh, in Monolua Bay, uh, what, four years ago, five years ago? Um, that, that project turned into, into uh, the world's largest invasive algae removal effort. Um, that is a project that took an incredible amount of will to, to make happen. And this community came together and made that project happen. Um, that project has had mixed success on the reef. Um, a lot of good has come out of it. Some things not so great out of it. Um, but the gains that that project generated beyond the reef um, are what I really look at and, and see as valuable for this community moving forward. Um, from that project, uh, we have, uh, I see now a community that is, um, involved, uh, is better informed, uh, and is incredibly motivated. Uh, and I joined that project a little bit later, but I was impressed by a community that, um, when motivated, was able to do something that a lot of people thought was pretty crazy. Um, and it's that level of motivation that's going to be needed uh, in order to address uh, fishing issues within uh, Monolua Bay. Um, it's a long, hard road, but I know that you guys can do it. Um, there are several people I, I got to thank um, before I leave. Our marine monitoring team, uh, who spends lots and lots of hours in the water, as folks listed up here at the top. Um, some of our other uh, uh, TNC members, past and present. Uh, Manuel, uh, who most of you probably know already, as well as Eric Coe. I know you, I know you guys know them. Uh, Jason Philibot, Alan Friedlander. Um, our, our funders for our, for our marine program, um, as well as uh, Malama Manalua and uh, all of the communities on the bay. Um, if you guys hadn't been so motivated, I wouldn't have ever gotten involved in Monolua Bay. And so I'm really happy that I've, I've had the opportunity to work here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Duane. It's great to see you back here in Hawaii. So, uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. John Kittinger, better known to all of us as Jack. Um, Jack is the Director of Conservation International's Hawaii program uh, in the Betty and Gordon Moore Center for Science and Oceans. Under his leadership of Conservation International, Hawaii works to restore seafood security in Hawaii, make sure we have enough fish, uh, by engaging communities and stakeholders to protect their critical natural capital, those bars that we were looking at, foster effective governance and promote the sustainable production, distribution, and consumption of locally sourced sustainable seafood. Jack is a social scientist by training, uh, but has broad interest in the ocean. Um, 
and uh, works to find how society relates to the ocean in the best possible ways. He's worked for several years with uh, Nature Conservancy and Malama Mauna Loa, uh, doing surveys of recreational and fishing use of Malana, Malama Mauna Loa Bay, and um, we still use those studies in our, our planning and our, our strategies. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Jack Kittinger. Okay, aloha mai kako. And thank you so much for the invitation to speak here today. I had meant to hold on to the handouts that I created just to show folks, but they all got snapped up, so you must all have them. Um, I printed out some of the studies that Duane and Manuel and I and others have kind of worked on, and, and some of those uh, results I'm gonna share with you today so you can carry those home, and um, if you have trouble sleeping later, you can review them and they'll be really helpful for falling asleep. But um, like Duane, I wanted to show and start off with um, some pictures of historical Mauna Lua Bay. And uh, I did my PhD here at UH on historical ecology. And so I lived very deeply in the history of how coral reefs have changed in Hawaii over time. And maybe I'm, I'm a little strange, but when I think of Mauna Lua, I envision this environment that I actually never had a firsthand experience with. And I really live it through the stories from people like Auntie Lara and others who describe this incredible place of abundance. Uh, and probably my favorite story, um, and I have to thank Duane because I stole this from one of his presentations, uh, is the story that she often tells of, uh, of uh, riding her horse when she was a young girl around the area. And the horses would come and they would drink fresh water out of, off the reef because the freshwater springs would bubble out of the reef. And the horses knew where that were. And it just, it just sounds so amazing. And, and it's really that kind of abundance that supported the communities of this area historically and still support them today. And that abundance was not an accident. That abundance was there um, because of stewardship and because of uh, people taking care of the place. And just as a small evidence of this, this is from the Gleason family. This is the little metal plate that the Pico area um, fishing families uh, had to designate their inclusion in this hui. And I remember interviewing um, Uncle Keeney uh, about this, and I think I was with View Manuel, and, and we were talking with him, and he, uh, I think it was Karen brought down the actual list of old rules, and they had these specific rules for Pico. All the way up to the 50s, these practices persisted. And I, I just wanna put this up there because often we think of these things as being historical and so historical that they're not really around, but this is within very much within living memory. And it's that stewardship ethic that um, drives the organization of Malama Mauna Lua today. And it's something that's, that we're actually working to revive, I think, collectively as a community of folks that care about this place uh, for various reasons. Now, here's a more kind of uh, contemporary map of the bay. And this is, don't try to read all the small print, but this is all the different various human uses that occur in the bay, from surfing, fishing, gathering limu, diving, uh, you name it, it's a very busy place now, and that's part of the um, challenge, but it's also part of the opportunity, right? Uh, those, those uses sometimes conflict. Um, they can put pressure on the reef, but it's also a vibrant community of resource users that stand ready to um, you know, steward the place should they be engaged in the right way, and that's what the organization's been doing uh, for the past many years. Of course, you see all those areas in pink. That's the development that's, of course, of much different... Uh, kind of uh, system than it was just a generation or two ago. Uh, the first research I guess that I'll share uh, is um, this work we did to assess together with um, folks around the bay the fishing uses in the environment and it really had two main goals it was to understand what kinds of fishing were occurring, uh, who's fishing where, what for and how and then to poll the fishing community about their opinions, uh, their preferences, uh, and what they felt about different potential management options for the bay. And this is a picture from uh, Alika, Wick, uh, Alika Winter's house. Alika's there in the brown shirt. Uh, you can see Carol over here in the back and uh, some other folks. I think there's Matt Ramsey, who works as a fisheries outreach agent. And um, you know, it's this group that went out and fanned out and interviewed fishermen in the bay. We interviewed almost 60 folks, uh, 
we preferentially interviewed folks that had multiple decades of experience fishing. That was deliberate on our part, so it wasn't necessarily a representative sample, but rather the folks who had the most experience fishing in the bay. And one of the first things we asked of folks when we did this interview uh, was to rank the health of the bay when they first started fishing and interacting in the bay and then carry it forward to today. And so the bottom there is just the last you know, six or so decades. And then on the a vertical axis, we just said, you know, tell us the condition of a bay of the bay on an axis from one to five stars. So one star being degraded, five stars being, you know, abundant, diverse, and healthy. And we asked this of folks uh, and separated out the data to the folks who had the least amount of time, and that was those folks still had a lot of experience in the bay, 24 years, and the folks that had a lot of time fishing the bay, over 45 years in this case. These are the um, uh, first quarter and third quarter of the sample. It just means that um, they all basically described a decline. But the folks who've been fishing there longer describe more of a decline. And that's what you would expect because they've seen it when it was more abundant. That historical shots that I showed, those folks were fishing in that bay for that period of time. And that's what we call a shifted baseline. And I often think about this when I think about my own kids because the conditions that they're growing up with, that's their baseline, right? Uh, the catches that fishermen are getting out of the bay have declined dramatically. These are the six, um, six of the more abundantly harvested species by fishermen that we surveyed. Uh, and you can see what people used to catch in green and what they were catching more currently in blue. And there's just stark declines. Now, Duane talked about all the factors implicated in this decline. I think one of the things that's key to this too is not only the pressures that contribute to this decline, but what you're losing is not only the quality of the habitat and the fish assemblage, but you're losing the service and the benefit that the community gets. And that's first and foremost, right? People harvest fish from this bay as a source of food, as part of cultural practice, for recreation, for a number of intertwined uh, uses, including commercial use. And when that resource goes down, you lose that benefit. Um, and there's diverse kind of dependencies and values that people have surrounding this fishery, and that came out in the survey. But uh, there were some kind of nucleation points or common themes. And we asked fishermen what they did with the catch after they caught it. And we kind of broke it up into kind of different uses. You know, we call this fish flow, because it's basically where does the fish flow to after it's caught? What, to what use, to what end, to what benefit is it applied? And if you look at this pie graph, the, the red and the orange show that's the fish that's kept for home consumption, either directly by the fishermen or it's given away as part of cultural practice to friends, family, and extended ohana. And that's the, by and large, that is the most uh, common type of fishing that has occurred both historically and currently in Mauna Loa Bay. Now, there is a commercial component to the catch, and that's around about 12%. Uh, we've probably underestimated that a bit, but... Even if we did, the vast majority of the use of the fish is for um, home consumption. So it's really a subsistence-dominated uh, fishery. And that's important because, again, when you lose the integrity of that fishery, you lose that food provisioning. You're basically eroding your food security. We also, as I mentioned, polled fishermen about what they think about different things around the bay. Um, the type is very small, but so I'll read this off. 77% of the fishermen we polled agree that the current rules and regulations uh, are not sufficiently enforced. So there's broad agreement that enforcement is a problem. And in fact, if you ask folks if they would support more effective enforcement, there's almost unanimity here. 97% of folks would actually like to see more improved enforcement. And this is not just, by the way, um, something that's atypical. This is across the Hawaiian Islands most fishermen see a need for increased enforcement. And we asked uh, them to kind of gauge a couple of um, management scenarios. And one of them was closing the bay totally. Well, unsurprisingly, the vast majority of the fishermen that were polled said, well, we wouldn't be in support of closing the bay totally. But um, more than two thirds of the fishermen said they would support a protected area in the bay for conservation and educational purposes. I'll return to that theme uh, towards the end. And then we asked about a couple of other specific kinds of things. Fishermen over three quarters would support a ban on certain types of gear, and almost two thirds would support a ban on certain species. So these are all management measures that, as Duane said, fishery management 
things that are on the table that are in our, our toolbox that we can actually use to improve fishery management currently. And some of these have broad support from the fishing community based on the survey. Critically, and probably the most important thing to me that came out of this is that almost 84% of the fishermen that we surveyed said they would be interested in actively participating in a community-based management program. And that's important. You need a critical mass of, uh, of folks who interact with the resource to be involved, and there's a high degree of interest in that here. And that's important because, as Duane mentioned, there's a, a kind of um, increased momentum now for community-based management all across the Hawaiian Islands. And um, we often call that back to the future management because, of course, historically under the Ahupua'a-based system, management was really place-based. And now we're returning to that. Um, a number of partners in the state and the federal government, including the sanctuary, who's here supportive of that. And there's kind of a grassroots groundswell of communities that are coming to the table to do that, including uh, Malama Mauna for this place. And we know that that works uh, socially because of the historical relevance of place-based management and because it's culturally grounded and it's the traditional practice, but it also works biologically. Uh, these, this graph just shows reef fish biomass. So the more fish, the better, under different kinds of management. And the top two are open to fishing and rotating closures, and those are pretty ineffective. In fact, you can kind of see open to fishing is almost the same as rotating closures. But the bottom two are no-take marine reserves and community-based management. And this is work that Alan Friedlander and I and others put together, and it shows that reef fish biomass is not statistically different between a no-take reserve and community-managed areas, and that's pretty important. You can recover reef fish through community-based management. It's very effective. And the communities that have pioneered this, including the folks over in Molokai, uh, have seen a lot of success. Uh, we'd like to see that same success here in Mauna Lua, at least we at CI, and I know the community's uh, jazzed up about the possibilities as well. And it's very hard to do community-based management, but this community has done hard things before, as Duane mentioned. Uh, Invasive algae and just invasive species in general are generally perceived around the globe to be an intractable and unsolvable problem. Uh, Try telling that to this group. They pulled 23 acres of it off the reef. Uh, we were involved and in, um, actually worked with Nature Conservancy and Manuel and Brad on this project to assess the social benefits associated with this project so that we can understand beyond the reef what are the benefits to the great hooky. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, and I assume most people are, uh, this is pretty incredible endeavor. This is more or less how the project worked. Uh, Pono Pacific, the locally based restoration contractor, uh, had a small army of folks out there pulling uh, the Alimu off the reef. Uh, this was all based on pilots that the community themselves had, uh, had pulled together with some existing scientists around the islands. And then based on that, we're able to attract a large grant from the federal stimulus bill to get it done. And we evaluated as part of this the kind of socioeconomic benefits for this. Um, this project was really what we started to call restoring the blue infrastructure. We're basically trying to restore the habitat so that it can restore the services that it provides the community. But it also created jobs, uh, 63 jobs. It supported over 250 individuals and 80 households over the life of the grant. It was a significant and incredible effort. And it also produced a number of great other benefits. And I totally stole this one from Duane, too, uh, because it is such a great shot of some of the uses in the bay. Um, these are some of the other things that folks um, noted as being beneficial. Clearer water, easier access to surf sites. I personally benefited from that at least a few times. Um, cleaner water and more recovered fish stocks. And not just seeing more fish, but documented evidence from scientific studies of increased catch in species. So it was working for fisheries habitat too. And those recreational benefits were important to the community, but the most important thing often in the interviews were the cultural benefits that people were realizing that they were seeing coming back as part of the reef. Um, increased opportunities for intergenerational knowledge transfer, people learning about the history, learning about what was right for the place, the cultural practices, the traditions, the stories, Instilling this idea of Malka to Mackay management, um, this incredible thing where uh, we were, the community was composting the algae and then using it on, and the farmers in the area were using, including Otsuji farms. I remember talking with Ed Otsuji and he said, the vegetables we grow with this stuff, he said, it's like rocket fuel. We just grow the most incredible vegetables with this invasive algae. <laughs> just, who could have predicted, right? 
and they got uh, UH folks out to help them compost. I even had a shot of Manuel over there turning the compost heaps, and it was just an incredible thing. But the idea that people were not just taking from the bay, but now they're giving back, right? That's, that was one of the most important mores that came out of these uh, interviews, that it's time to give back. We've taken so much, it's time to give back. And restoring that kind of notion that it's our place, it's our responsibility. And this is a big, diverse community. There's 60,000 people that live adjacent to Montalua Bay. That's a lot of people. That's a diversity of kinds of people. And this project raised the profile of the organization, but it also raised the profile of the bay within the community. And that was pretty critical. Um, the, the organization had done a lot of different communication styles. By far and large, everyone that we interviewed and, um, heard about it through word of mouth. So the social network that this project created was also a significant resource in and of itself. And it, and it trickled out to other cultural um, aspects, including use of traditional names. And this kind of sums it up. This is one of the key quotes that we put in the kind of summary report here. Is that, Really, this is restoration beyond the reef. We're not just restoring the reef, but the community. And in closing, you know, I, I live in Niu now. And I've, I've had the honor and privilege of working with Malama Matalua for, I don't know, five or six years now. It's been an incredible opportunity. And I'm in, uh, I'm in the position now to be able to aid them in, in new ways as the director of the CI Hawaii program. But I'm also, you know, a homeowner in the area. Uh, a father to two children. Uh, I'm a family person who's going to raise my kids on this bay. And I remember hearing, when I, when I hear these stories from Nainoa talking about what it used to look like, I think to myself, what are the stories my kids are going to tell? And what is our role going to be to inform that story? And the story that I want them to tell is that, you know, when we grew up, the bay was junk. But we revitalized it and we restored it, and now it's this place of abundance. And it's because we did something about it. And that's the story that we basically have the power to kind of create. So uh, with that, I'll just say thank you. Thanks, Jack. Our next speaker, Dr. Sim Kim Selko. Um, and the title of her talk very clearly <laughs> puts out what we're all thinking about. What kinds of efforts and how much are needed to protect and restore Hawaii's reefs? What can we do and how much of it do we need to do? So before she begins her talk, I'd like to give you a little background on Kim. She's a marine scientist, um, earned her PhD at uh, UC Santa Barbara, University of California at Santa Barbara. She has three main areas of research, the science of marine conservation, Connectivity and Genetics of Hawaiian Reefs, and Market-Based Strategies for Seafood Sustainability. Currently, she leads a, a collaborative project with Alan Friedlander and Kirsten Olison at the University of Hawaii, HMB, to understand ecological tipping points on Hawaiian reefs. And she'll explain to us what uh, tipping points means. So welcome, Kim. Thanks for being here. Aloha. Um, so these were great talks, and I'm so excited to dig in with Jack and Dwight about these data sets. Um, and uh, I'll tell you more about kind of what my colleagues and I have been thinking about um, in terms of how we can start to tackle these issues and make some of the tough decisions um, ahead of us. So the Ocean Tipping Points Project is a four-year collaboration that began in 2012 with um, some founding partners, um, UC Santa Barbara and the institute I uh, reside at, NCs there, um, focused on ecological synthesis uh, with NOAA, uh, the Center of Ocean Solutions at Stanford, Environmental Defense, Defense uh, Fund, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation was um, the main funder. Um, and since we've uh, gotten into this work and started to really dig into things, we've focused here in Hawaii and gotten um, some great additional support from the Coral Reef Conservation Program. So I want to acknowledge the importance of this funding. Um, and 
when we started the Ocean Tipping Points project, we really didn't know where we were going to focus. Um, we quickly started to work on that. Jack, at that time, was a member of our team uh, at Center of Ocean Solutions, and he and I lobbied hard for studying Hawaii, and I'm very glad that we were successful because it's an amazing place to work, and uh, um, I've been working here for over um, eight years now, nine years, um, at Coconut Island, uh, first working uh, on issues related to Papahana, Mokoakea, um, and now more broadly across the archipelago with different projects. So um, when we started to formulate this case study of Hawaii, we um, reached out to Alan Friedlander and Kirsten Olison um, and put together a really great analysis team. This is a dream team, and we all just met here for a week. We locked ourselves in a house and we hashed out everything we're gonna do, and we all had so much fun. It was really, um, I felt really blessed to be part of this team and um, a lot of young energy and great collaborative spirit. Um, and we have some very important um, collaborators and advisors um, to keep us real and keep us focused on the issues at hand, including Malia Chow and Alia Herman the, um, at the sanctuary, um, Fraser McGillivray and Jack Kittinger, now in his new role. Um, and we have very important collaborators over at NOAA, the Ivor Williams, um, and some folks um, around the world. So what are ocean tipping points? Um, we define ocean tipping points as when incremental changes in human use result in large and sometimes abrupt changes in ecosystems. Um, so these changes might be changes in co the community structure, the functions you get in occurring on the reefs, and often the benefits to people, the fishing and the water clarity. Um, and so it's kind of all about surprise and unpredictability. Um, and when uh, we kind of assume that things are simple and predictable, we usually uh, you know, end up struggling. So. Um, this is an effort to really start to infuse some realism and complexity into our thinking about um, how ecosystems are affected by humans, and in this case, in coral reefs. So just to kind of a um, little primer on how we think about ocean tipping points from a scientific perspective, um, we think about a plot where you might have human use on the side here plotted against ecosystem condition. Um, in a linear change, there would be no tipping point. You could kind of scale up or scale back your human use, and you would know what was going to happen with the environmental condition. But when there is a tipping point, you have a nonlinear change. You have this period of rapid change that you might not know where it is and when it's going to happen and how severe it'll be, and that's the tipping point. It's a threshold response. It's the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and so we see evidence of tipping point behavior in marine, reef, marine ecosystems from all over the world. And um, other members of our group um, have collected um, hundreds of examples of these and distilled them down and figured out what are the sort of commonalities among them and what are the differences and started to find um, you know, these themes that multiple human use are always involved multiple types, often climate change as a driver. Um, and there's a whole host of things that I can't go into now, but we're getting some really neat insights. On coral reefs, what, look, what scientists for many years now have sort of conceptualized um, is that there is a coral-dominated state that a, whole, a reef can exist in, and there's an algal-dominated state. So in the coral-dominated state, um, you have this feedback, this cycle that where the fish and the urchins graze on the algae and that keeps space clear for coral to settle and the coral reefs then grow up and create more space and habitat for the fish. Um, and this cycle continues and it reinforces that system. It becomes stable and it has resilience. So um, you can start to put pressure on it and disturb it and it will be able to absorb that, that disturbance without major change because of this feedback. But when um, you push it too far, you get um, an algal-dominated system. When the fish are gone, the algae grows up, and the coral have no place to recruit, and they get smothered by the algae. Um, and that can be a very hard cycle to break. So we need to know where is the tipping point, and what do we put on the axes here? How can we measure this? How can we get in the water and know where that tipping point is, and what 
um, indicators, what early warning signs will tell us that it's coming, or what indicators will tell us that on our algal-dominated system, like in Mauna Loa Bay, we might be starting to get close to a tipping point that will push us back into a coral-dominated state. So the research questions that we're tackling over the next two years with our big team um, are what regimes exist across Hawaiian reefs? Is there a coral regime and an algal regime? Or are there more regimes than that? And how do we define them and recognize them? What drivers cause reefs to transition between regimes? And what, which of those drivers act synergistically in our particular problem? What can we monitor to determine changes to regimes? Um, as I said, there should be certain species or metrics about diversity and ratios of benthic cover that will tell us something about how um, close we are to a tipping point and how another way to think of that is how much resilience is there in the system. Um, and importantly, we want to also dive into with this sort of knowledge we'll get from these first three questions, what management actions are most relevant to the drivers we find and the regimes we find? And can we start to do analyses that will tell us which actions reduce um, conflict around managing those drivers and maximize the benefit? So if I have time, I will go into some case examples of what we mean by that. So the important thing is that even though coral reef science for many decades has this gradation from coral dominated to algal dominated, Hawaii doesn't fit that bill at all. Uh, there's a huge range of what a healthy Hawaiian reef looks like from you know, boulder fields and wave dominated environments with very little coral cover, um, but high relief that supports uh, diverse fish communities to protected bays with the classic high coral cover and fragile um, coral uh, morphologies um, to turf dominated reefs, turf algae dominated reefs that are very productive for fish. Um, and we're not sure how that fits into these regimes to the typical macroalgal dominated state. So our project goals are um, kind of to distill all of those, the, the answers to those questions into how can we apply these new concepts around ocean tipping points and, and methods, tools to help apply those concepts to elucidate tipping points on Hawaiian reefs? Um, and very importantly, how can we make those findings accessible and actionable by marine stewards? Um, and that's why we have a big team with a lot of partners and we're always looking for more partners and more perspectives from the community and um, you know, all, all different types to help give us pictures of what um, this, you know, stewardship to them looks like and what they need. Um, so just kind of drilling into this idea of what I mean by the concepts, providing those concepts. Um, the key concepts I'll stress here are that multiple regimes exist with distinct drivers and, and threshold relationships between them. And that's what we want to nail down scientifically. And that stewards can use information on thresholds and drivers to prevent or cause tipping points between regimes. In the case of restoration, you'd want to cause a tipping point. Um, and this is sort of new. We haven't tried this in the marine realm to apply these concepts in this way. There's um, assumptions that we all make when we go out and think about what a coral reef does, how it functions, and what management actions will do to it. Um, and we're getting a lot of information from around the world that there's a system behavior that has some predictable characteristics and we're going to try to sort of apply that thinking here and see what we get. So um, a little more detail on the methods that we're going to try to attempt and the tools that we'll create by testing out these methods. Um, we're going to focus on a space for time data synthesis which means using the great array of biological data, all the sampling data from around the islands, to look at what the diversity of uh, coral reef state is. And then um, we will also start to do something called a trade-off analysis to help decisions about what locations, drivers, and actions to prioritize. So I'm gonna just briefly give you a preview of the types of products we hope to have from this project. One is a database of biological surveys building on a huge effort across many sources. Right now we have data all fi um, formatted and parsed for 
22,000 separate transects around the Hawaiian Islands, that's a whole archipelago, um, at five, clustered into 5,000 sites in the benthic, similar numbers. Um, and we're gonna be able to both characterize regimes with our statistical analysis and also map them out. So this is not a result, this is just a cartoon that illustrates what a map would look like. And in reality, the spatial scale of variation would be much finer than that. Um, and we'll be able to, to quantify that scale of variation, which will be very important for managers to understand the scales of variation. And we're gonna definitely look at long-term data sets as long as we can find. Obviously, we've heard from Jack that um, there's been massive change in these shifting baselines, so it'll be hard to go back in time, but um, we'll do our best. And then we also wanna link up this characterization of regimes with assembling all possible spatial data on where drivers of change occur. So that could be biophysical drivers, the natural environment, how that shapes reefs, and the human uh, uses that shape reefs. Um, so we've done a huge effort to get all these different data layers together, and one thing you can do is map out how they interact and where they occur together, and this is also just for illustrative purposes, but we're gonna map out, um, you know, where you're getting different amounts of stress all interacting and which types those are. So that should be a very broadly useful tool for managers and stakeholders. And then we get into the nitty gritty statistical analyses of how we figure out what are the top drivers of these regimes, where are the thresholds, so the top figure shows a threshold. Um, this is preliminary data that will likely change um, between a coral regime and pollution. So you end up getting a drop off. You don't see coral regimes anymore when the pollution levels are high. Um, it, and that will give us our threshold levels. Um, and then we can start to form hypotheses about what are the key interactions among um, the factors that create those regimes and those regime shifts. Um, so that's just a model saying wave forcing has direct effects on the amount of fishing and the coral cover um, and indirect effects on herbivorous fish and turf cover mediated through coral and fishing and that affects how much macroalgal and turf cover you have. So these are the type of models we'll put together and that should um, lead us to indicators that managers can use to monitor change and um, the results of actions they take. So briefly, we also want to um, undertake trade-off analyses where we drill into specific trade-offs between different stressors. So these, this type of analysis is piloting in West Maui, and we're gonna look at what reefs are best served by land-based management versus ocean-based, and how can we ma minimize trade-offs and maximize benefits. So I'm gonna do this really quick. Um, you can look at every possible um, management action on the table, and in Mauna Loa Bay, that might be different types of fishing regulations, reserve designs, and you can assign a cost to it and also a benefit from it and you get this cloud of points that has a range. And what you wanna do is look at the points, this is that outer edge of points, that have um, the highest benefit for the least cost. And that can really help stakeholders visualize where they can get win-win um, solutions. Um, and so here's one example for uh, just looking at um, how you might fix roads. And this one segment of road right here would, uh, by fixing it, may lead to a 15% reduction in sediment export um, in this watershed. And this is all very preliminary data, but we got our students started on working out these methods and it's going really well. So just to sum up, um, I think that understanding tipping points can clarify the management options. You can get quantified metrics of regime state to serve as benchmarks of ecological change. Um, these thresholds suggest natural limits of use that you can build your regulations around and your, also your expectations for recovery efforts. Um, and the choice of management targets can then be linked to tipping points and ecological feedback mechanisms. Um, and you know, here in Mauna Loa Bay where we have a lot of data, especially all the social preference and service data, this is a, a key place where we could start to drill into that. So we're hoping to have sort of some case studies within Hawaii, one in Mauna Loa Bay, one in West Maui, one in West Hawaii, and one maybe in a more unimpacted place like Lanai or uh, Niihau. Okay, so I'll end here. Our timeline is to have our data analyzed by the end of next year, produce maps and findings, 
and then start to drill into to really tackle specific management issues um, into 2016. And I'd stress again that we're really looking to partner with folks to do outreach and um, get ideas and feedback throughout this process. So um, please get in touch, and, and Jack's also a great um, resource here uh, for that. And that's it, thank you very much. Our next and final speaker, uh, after whom we'll have a uh, question and answers of all of the speakers. Uh, our next speaker is Brad Kaaleleo Wong. Brad is a trained, academically and practically trained marine biologist with a degree from the University, California State University in Long Beach in marine biology. He's currently a volunteer crew member with the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and he's sailed with the uh, PVS since 2010, participating in several long distance deep sea voyages, including Hiki Analia's maiden voyage from uh, Aotearoa to Hawaii, from New Zealand back. And uh, he recently served as a watch captain on Hiki Analia for the Samoan leg of the Malama Hanua Worldwide Voyage. Professionally, Brad works uh, for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs as a program specialist, helping to manage the uh, Papahanao Mokuakea uh, Marine National Monument. Uh, Brad will be talking to us about something of local and international importance, and that is the Malama Honua Worldwide Voyage, and how communities around the world, just like our community here, uh, wish to and need to manage their marine resources in the best possible ways. Brad? Yeah, again, my name is uh, Brad. Um, I actually, uh, I have some experience within Mauna Loa. I'm not from here, I'm actually from Kailua. Um, but a lot of the experience I had was when I was working with the Nature Conservancy and I was actually with these two guys. Um, they helped me a lot in, uh, in my professional career and um, I learned a lot from them about uh, Mauna Loa, um, especially from Malama Mauna Loa, um, helping to work a lot with the, the Great Huki Project and um, doing a lot of the, the actually the, the benthic uh, surveys and mapping of, of the Paiko area. Um, I just came back from Samoa in um, the end of August and early September, and um, was it that? And one of the things that um, part of our mission, I guess, as crew members, is to kind of bring back what we learned from um, from sailing and to kind of kind of learn from these other places that we see, whether it's culturally, whether it's um, the I guess the, the environmental issues that they have and see what are the differences is, see what we can do better here in Hawaii. Um, also to kind of share what we, what we do uh, elsewhere, in the, in, what we do here elsewhere in, in the world. Um, it's gonna give a quick uh, overview of the worldwide voyage and where we're going. Um, the voyage is a, will continue on for another three more years. Um, and we're actually sailing to 26 different countries and 62 different ports, uh, encompassing 45, uh, 45,000 miles across the world. Um, currently, the canoes are in Aotearoa right now. I think they just arrived in, in um, Auckland, New Zealand, uh, yesterday or today. Uh, and we've traveled out through the Pacific in two different, um, two different areas, um, traveling through Tahiti. Uh, this, is in, uh, this is in Huahine. And actually, when they're in Tahiti, they, they got to to, uh, to see an area in, on the island of Tahiti that they were doing um, some coral restoration work, um, some, cor some cor coral growth work and um, restoration in, in, in that area. Uh, we also traveled to um, Swain's Island, and this is actually Olohenga is the, is the official, is the traditional name of this place. Um, this, is from my, this is from my voyage, um, going to Swain's and the rest of Samoa. Um, and um, down to Aotearoa, this is in Aotearoa, where the canoes are at the moment. This, this, this canoe is um, Natoki Mata Faurua. It's a, it was a canoe built for the, for the memorial of the, the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, so this just happened uh, about a month ago. And basically, like I was saying, like, what is the purpose of our, of, of our voyage? Why are, we, why are we traveling to these different places? And 
you know, a lot of a lot of the things that we want to do is to really just bring back what what we what we see and to kind of share that. Malama um, Hono itself means to just care for our 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 own world, our wherever we live, whatever we wherever we are, and um, try to take care of the, those spaces in in time. And part of the way that we we do this while we're while we're traveling uh, through these different countries and through these different ports is to do a lot of outreach in, the, in these areas. Uh, a lot of the places we, we, do, uh, we do go to, we'll have um, community events for the canoes, um, as we did here across the, 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 the Paina um, last year, as we traveled around, um, sharing the canoe, sharing our kind of a vision, trying to get people to, to realize that, you know, our resources are, are pretty limited and, and um, to share that, you know, we, we do a lot here in Hawaii and it is good work and uh, you know people are we can learn from people around the world and the, the things that they're doing and they can actually learn from us as well um, so this is actually a, a poster that we created to uh, uh, to show at some of the ports and it kind of describes some of the different science projects on the canoes on the on the, on the canoe that we do um, we're right now we're looking at um, the fish fish guts seeing what the um, seeing what fish are eating trying to look at uh, the different aspects of, I guess, where these fish are roaming, how are, how are they eating, and uh, how healthy they are. Also looking at plankton. Um, they were looking into doing some hydroponics on the canoe. Uh, uh, also marine debris studies, whale acoustics, and um, water quality assessments throughout all the different ports and all through, uh, throughout as we sailed along. Um, I was also actually one of the science uh, coordinators on top of the canoe and we as we're doing water quality I guess we we look at it pretty much like two or three times a day um, and so there's actually a lot of data um, with the canoes for where they've traveled to see how healthy our oceans actually are um, one of the main things that I, I guess that I enjoyed about about sailing is to get to see these different places in the world and get to see um, the different resources that other places have. Um, this picture was in Fangatele Bay in American Samoa. Uh, and one of the things that really took me, took, that I really took home, I guess, from, from American Samoa and Samoa itself is the reefs are really beautiful and intact. Um, they don't have the same type of uh, influences from, from land use that we have here in Hawaii. Uh, and so they don't have a lot of sedimentation of their reefs. And when we went to Fangatele Bay, this is a, this is a bay that was decimated. Um, the corals were decimated by almost, I think, 90% were, were dead in the 70s because of the Crown of Thorns outbreak. Uh, it's a sea star. And to see what it went from, in, from like in the late 70s to what it is now was just, was just amazing. It was, Probably the nicest, I've done a lot of, not a lot of diving, but I've done some diving here in Hawaii, done a lot of um, dive surveys and seen different types of reefs here in Hawaii. And I had never ever seen a be as beautiful of a reef as, as I ever had in, in, um, in Fangatele. The, the coral cover was, was pretty amazing. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, we didn't see a whole lot of fish, I guess, when we were there. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of um, pua, a lot of baby fish. Um, within Fangatele Bay, uh, maybe so there may be there may be some fishing pressures. We didn't get a good chance to kind of talk with um, with community members about about those kinds of things. But um, just to see that kind of health of of, a, of an ecosystem was um, was very striking to me. Uh, we also got a chance to to go around with the National Park Service over there in American Samoa to, and he kind of showed us and talked a lot about their their uh, terrestrial realm and, and how, I guess, how they do management in, um, on their land side. And what I, when I, what I learned from, from that was they had a, a, a very native dominated ecosystem um, for, for vegetation. Um, from all the way up in the mountains to all the way to the ocean was, was almost completely um, native species. And they had invasive species. They had things like Albizia, um, Koa Haole, and some other things as well, but for the most part, it was pretty much dominated by, by native species. And why, to me, why this is important, um, coming from here and, and doing um, environmental conservation work, uh, I kind of realized that, you know, 
hey, maybe this is the reason why their, their reefs are so clean. And sure enough, when I was talking to uh, a colleague of mine from Fish and Wildlife Service, she said, yeah, they, because of their, their ecosystem and how healthy their land base is, you know, their, their, their forests act like that sponge. And when it rains, which it does pretty often in, um, in the South Pacific and especially in American Samoa, uh, you know, the, the forest soaks up their water. By the time it gets to the, the streams, it's still, it's still clean. And by the time it gets to the ocean, it's still clean. And the water in Samoa is pretty crystal clear, as it is throughout the rest of, um, of um, the South Pacific as well. And you know, it could be because they don't have these, these same type of um, uh, land use influences that we have here in Hawaii. Um, well, I, I think the biggest thing that I, that I took home from, I guess, from me sailing was, was uh, was to learn from the from the cultures that we see um, from on the canoe, uh, wherever Hokulea goes, it's traveling with Hokulea is kind of a different thing than just traveling by herself. She has kind of this this aura with her that wherever she goes, people are kind of drawn to her for whatever reason. You know, they they feel her mana, they feel the, um, what she stands for, and you know, Samoa was no different, and neither neither was Aotearoa or Tahiti or Cook Islands as well, and. Hokulea really brings out all kinds of people just to see the canoe. And as we were sitting in Apia, um, Apia is in, in uh, independent Samoa. Uh, the canoes were anchored pretty much right in the, in the bay area in Apia. And there's a small little beach area over there, and they're maybe not more than 10 feet offshore. And every day we would see um, people just you know coming to the canoe, sitting down, enjoying you know, enjoying their, their evening and, you know, people work hard in some way, you know, they're, they're not, they're trying not to waste time, but, you know, for some reason they come to the canoe every day and you, you talk to them, they don't know a whole lot about the va'as, um, but, but they would come every day and, uh, you know, one of the kids from the village nearby, he would, he would actually come and help us on the canoe and, you know, I asked him one day, this kid Vito, he, I asked him one day, I was like, Hey man, why do you? Um, how come you're here every day? It's, it's awesome that you're helping. Thanks for coming. He was he was helping us do lashings and carrying equipment, and he just told me, you know, I, I like this canoe. I I don't know why, but I just like this canoe, and that's you know, Hokulea, is, Hokulea and um, to a, to an extent, and and he and Alia and the rest of the the va'a, they 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 have this uh, presence to them, and. Uh, one of the other things that we got to do in Apia was to visit with the uh, the head of state of uh, America of Samoa of independent Samoa, and he he really spoke to how you know culture is is kind of you know the backbone of our societies and for him you know people in Samoa were, were sort of on the way to not wanting to learn their culture not wanting to be someone. Uh, and, you know, for me and a lot of the other crew members, actually for all of the other crew members, going to Samoa and going to all these other places, you know, people still hold on to their culture. They still hold true to, to who they are. They still speak their language. They still have traditional practices. Um, and in, definitely in Samoa, things are still governed under a, under a chief system. And, you know, you... Uh, resources are kind of managed under that same system. So, um, you know, it was, it was very important that, you know, he, he told us about this. And, you know, for me, it just brought heart that, you know, you know, I, maybe we don't all olelo Hawaii, or maybe we don't all do different cultural practices here in Hawaii. But at the same time, we have a lot of people that want to learn. And I think that was the biggest part that, that I took home was people want to learn, people want to make things better here. And um, I, I hope that, you know, the people in Samoa that, that we saw, I hope they learned that from us, that, you know, you need that drive, you need, you need, um, you need that to, to kind of move forward. One, one thing that, um, that I think that I strive to do being a part of Papahano Mokuakea and trying to manage that area is trying to blend science and conservation with culture as well. And having that base, having that, um, that cultural base uh, can really help us to move forward, help us to look, look into the future from, um, through, the eyes of a, through, through the eyes of the past, I guess, so to say. 
Um, one of the, you know, our, our navigators and our navigators of old and even the navigators of today, like Nainoa, um, my friend Kaleo, and Kayulani, and um, Kalepa, and Onohi, you know, they, they're, they're actually the scientists of today. You know, they're, they're all, they, they really look at all the different aspects of the world, taking in all, taking in cal different calculations and observations from the world, and utilizing them um, and to make sound decisions. And um, one of the, another story that uh, I guess I, I, I kind of want to share is, as we were uh, trying to leave Pongo Pongo, it kind of took us a while to kind of, to, to get out of Pongo Pongo. Um, it was really, really stormy. And um, this kind of has to do with uh, cultural knowledge and, and things that, that, we, that we learned from our kupuna and our ancestors. Um, as we're sitting in, uh, sitting in the bay trying to decide if we're going to go sailing or not, um, we, um, it, was a, it was probably the, one, of those, one of the stormiest days over there. And I know I didn't really know if he wanted to leave yet. He decided to, to, po um, to poke the canoes outside the bay just to see if it was okay. And um, Hokulea kind of went out of the bay just to kind of check things out in the ocean. And us and, Ho uh, and Hikian Aliya kind of stayed within the bay in Pongo Pongo. And um, as we're sitting there, I kind of was kind of looking around um, checking out um, Pongo Pongo and the area over there, and above us we saw I saw an Eva, um, the frigate birds. I, had, I saw a few above us, and f I remember it uh, in Olalo no Eo. It was Lele um, Eva Malie Kai Koo, which means if the Evas are flying out, um, the rough seas will be calm. And I remembered this Olalo no Eo, and I was kind of thinking to myself, oh man, maybe it's okay. You know, these Evas are out flying. You know, they're following us around. Maybe they're protecting us. And sure enough, you know, after we thought the rough seas were calm, I know radios us from the canoe and says, "Okay, we're gonna go." And sure enough, they cut loose. We we ended up going out to sea as well. And um, those are kind of some of the things that these are these are um, hundreds of years of, of knowledge to to see people kind of bring that. And you know, it's nice to see that these things are still happening today. And and we need to just recognize those those things as well. Um, utilizing culture within management is something that we try to do um, at Papahano Moku Akea. Um, it's the, and it's kind of taken us to where we are today, trying to get projects that have a cultural base, trying to get projects that, that have that science focus, but utilizing culture as well. Um, and I guess one of the things in American Samoa, another thing that I learned in American Samoa about how do they utilize culture um, is they go to these, because everything is governed by a chief still, and they still have sort of an ahupua'a system, so to say, you know, they, they still go to these, these chiefs and they work with those communities to do their, to do their um, marine management work. And, you know, that was, very humbling to see, and it's something that we're trying to do here um, with Haena and Mo'omomi and other places in, in Hawaii as well. And, you know, it's something that they try to do there as well. So um, that was definitely nice to see places like that. And, you know, some of the, we can still do things here in Hawaii to make things better. And one of the things that we, we have done here in Hawaii is create this uh, Promise to Pai Aina. Um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a promise that a lot of the government and nonprofit organizations and state organizations have come together to say, how can we make Hawaii better while Hokulea and Hikenalia are away from Hawaii? Um, it kind of gives a timestamp to a lot of the projects that we've always wanted to do. Um, it's a commitment that a lot of big organizations have committed to, and it's something that, you know, people like you can do as well, people across Hawaii can do as well, just to, what can we do to make Hawaii better? And it's all those, um, it's all the little things, things like helping to, you know, maybe we need to recycle more, or maybe we need to get involved with a nonprofit organization, things to give back, like, um, like Jack was saying. Culture is that, that base that we, we, that we really need to, to rally around, uh, and, it's definitely helped me in, in, in the work that I do. 
uh, it's, it brings new light, it brings different aspects of, of how to view the world, how to view how we do re um, resource management. And it's something that you see all across the Pacific. It's something that you see um, in the people around the Pacific. And um, you know, as the canoes travel around the world, we hope to see that as well, that people are still holding on to their, their native cultures because they do have value, they do have um, power to them, and there's a lot of knowledge built up over hundreds and hundreds and generations and generations. So um, again, thank you guys for, for coming today, and I um, hope you guys enjoyed uh, all of our talks. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Listening to the talks, I remembered an old 1960s motto about uh, thinking globally and acting locally. Do you remember that? It was in a very different context. But that's really what we need to do is to think what our local actions will do globally. That's what um, the Worldwide Voyage is doing, is taking local attitudes and actions and showing how they have global reach and physically going around the globe to show the importance of those local attitudes, cultural uh, treasures and, and behaviors. Any voyage, whether it's a physical, geographical one like uh, the worldwide voyage or it's a behavioral or attitudinal or intellectual voyage requires knowing where you're at. And we have a lot of evidence, uh, data, uh, growing sets of data and better analysis of where we're at. Um, but we really need to know where we want to go to. And we have glimpses of that. The speakers gave us that. But the important point of getting from here to there is a plan. What are the steps we need to take to get there? What are the resources we need? Hokulea certainly planned carefully about that. If we are going to make a voyage from now on Moanalua Bay to a better place for Moanalua Bay, we have to know how we're going to get there. And that requires planning, uh, community discussion at great length because Ecologists know that communities are diverse, but healthy communities are diverse, but sociologists know that the more diverse a community, sometimes the longer it takes to reach accord. <laughs> so, um, Malama Monalua and his colleague organizations and the community, all of you, will be looking in the next months and years to come to help develop that map, that plan, that, that voyage um, plan to get from where we are now in uh, Monaloa Bay, which I think, as your graphs show, Jack, we agree is not the way we would really like it to be, how to get from there to a much healthier uh, and more productive bay for all of the various uses that our community has for it. So thank you again, speakers, for a wonderful presentation. Very diverse, but locally focused, but globally important. Thank you. Give my hand. <laughs> and now, uh, if you have questions, uh, I, we encourage questions. Uh, my question, I, I guess, starts with the first speaker. Why do we want more fish? Is it a means to an end? Or is it simply an indicator of the health of the ecosystem in general? Or is it something we want just because we want it? Jack gave us a little answer on, uh, for cultural reasons. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's all of those. I mean, um, you know, why, why do we want more fish? Um, I was asked to talk specifically about, uh, about fish today. Fish resonate with, with most people, um, whether you're Hawaiian or Tahitian or Samoan, um, you know, fish are very important to, to island cultures. But, um, it, you know, I, I think ultimately what people want is, is a healthier environment, um, a healthier reef. Um, and, and fish are an obvious and important component of, of that healthiness. Um, it's, it's good for a reef to have you know, diversity on it and things along those lines. So improving those aspects of reef are good for the reef itself, for the, the value of that reef and the function of that reef. Um, but having more fish are, 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 is also important to people. Um, so that's a service that that, 
uh, Reef is providing back to people. So there's, there's a lot of different reasons why people may want more fish. Um, everybody in the room may have a different reason for why they might want more fish. Uh, and all of those reasons are equally valid. So I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I, I tried to. Yeah, I, if I could add one tiny bit to that. Um, there's almost unanimous scientific consensus that you need certain kinds of fish and diversity of fish on a reef for them to be healthy as an ecosystem. But why you want that, the social kind of values for why you want those reefs are diverse. And some people in the community want more fish on the reef so they can eat more fish from the reef. And some people from the community want more fish on the reef so they can see more fish on the reef. So there's a diversity of values. I think the key is finding the nucleation point, which is, you know, if there's a critical mass of people who really feel like those bars that Dwayne showed are a bad thing, that we ought to do something about it, you know. When you, you put up one of your graphs or something, um, one of the level, one of the factors that I didn't see up there were the uh, pH levels and how that impacts the coral. Um, could you comment on that? as far as um, what, what kind of effects that's actually having? It, it, which one are you directing that? Uh, whomever. One of the biologists, that's for sure, <laughs> not the social scientists. <laughs> Do you want to talk about pH? I, I can talk generally that it is an important factor um, and that we do have maps of estimated change in pH from pre-industrial levels. So we will be factoring that in and looking at it. And that needs to be complemented by, you know, in the water and experimental studies of how uh, coral react to pH that Paul Joe Keel and others um, around Hawaii are doing. So I think we will have some answers about that. We probably know, and Duane will comment on this with much more scientific rigor than I will, that pH stress, i.e. acidification stress, is small compared to other stresses in the bay. Is that the case? Do we know that? So I'm prompting you. I, yeah, I see that. You're putting me on the spot is what you're doing. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not super knowledgeable about the literature on pH. Um, some of the stuff I do know is that uh, the, currently at this point in time, there are probably some stressors that are uh, a lot more uh, influential out there. Um, in the long term, that, that may or may not hold up. Um, pH may be one of those things that is acting synergistically with other stuff and may cause heightened sort of responses later. Um, it's an active area of research uh, currently. Um, some folks are finding that um, the health of your ecosystem is really important for how it will respond to climate change. So the more, uh, the healthier your local system is, the higher the resilience in that system. So if you can go in and clean up things like local stressors, um, they may actually help make your reef more resilient against these sort of big global things that uh, can be very difficult to um, address at a local level. Um, I mean, things we do here are not gonna change ocean pH levels across the world. Um, but things that we do here could potentially help the reefs here survive uh, in a changing pH environment. Did, did you want to say something? You, well, you were reaching across. I mean, I, I, you said it, but basically if you have fish to help um, increase coral survival, then the decrease in coral growth rates that will come from pH problems will be offset. So there are these synergistic effects, and so that's a more detailed way that protecting, you know, abating local stressors will uh, really help resilience. Some, I, had, oh, uh, I was just going to add one more quick thing. Um, uh, a lot of people get overwhelmed by the concept of climate change. Um, and something that I've been asked several times is, well, what, what can I do about it? Um, what we're finding is that people can do a lot about it at, at a local level by addressing local stressors and issues. Um, they, can, they can do a lot to help their local place, which, which is very important to people. I mean, your, your local place is where you live. That's the place you really want to see uh, doing well. 
Somebody mentioned the community-based fisheries um, program in Haena, and I was wondering how much um, a discussion is going on currently about uh, Mauna Loa. I mean, there was the, the graphs. Is there any particular organization that is taking that on or talking about it actively or? Well, Malama Mauna Loa is, you know, actively developed in a community stewardship program for the Bay um, and, um, and is looking at a number of options as I understand it. I mean, they're a lot of the folks that are leading that organization are here, so I encourage you to speak directly to them. But, um, but yeah, I think that's one of the main options that's on the table that we're all, and it's, in terms of support network, I mean, that's kind of what we all represent as uh, folks who sit in nonprofit, academia, OHA, and other supporting organizations that um, are partners to Malama Maralu, including the sanctuary, and um, are going to help heal the bay in a number of ways. So is that sufficiently vague? <laughs> I have a question that probably follows up uh, along the same kind of thinking, but there doesn't seem to be enough coordination. We have a lot of feral animals like cats, and you combine that with the concrete runoff, and guess what happens to the bay? Yeah. Is there any coordination going on with the people that can do something about the feral animals? Because other islands have uh, the feral pigs, and they're digging up things, and uh, there's a stressor right there. And people have got to be working together, I would think. Um, as to what's specifically going on in Manalua Bay with regard to feral animals, I'm, I'm not. I'm not that certain. Um, there are probably other people in this room who know a lot better. I don't know, maybe maybe Leighton might know well, or know of somebody who knows. I'm not a specialist in feral cats, but I, I was just going to insert that the point that you bring up is, is one of those questions that any plan to get from here to there has to take in. You can't just think about two or three things. That's why community involvement in developing that plan of getting from the bay the way it is now, the bay at a better place, is going to involve a lot of planning. And as, um, as Kim's, one of her slides shows, there's uh, the overlay of maps. That's actually a cartoon of a, a, a way to plan things by uh, using geographical information systems. You get maps, talk to people, and what do you see as a problem here? And we, you make a map of that and so forth. And eventually, you come up with, hopefully, an effective plan that is going to get us to the right place uh, with the right resources and the right help. This is a real specific problem. We live on Ha Ha Ioni, and there is a hill behind our building, and the hill has feral cats, and someone climbs over the, uh, the concrete drain and feeds those cats on the hill. So then we have a rainstorm, and we can smell the calf feces being washed down through the uh, wire fence. There's a wire fence, um, I guess it's a cyclone fence, washing down through that fence, and that water uh, that dr drains right into the bay, and it's definitely cat feces, and it's and I, I, I it just has to be following the following the bay. It we can smell it, and I, I know that it, I know where it's, it goes, and it's really bad. Right. I have a three and a five year old, so I'm familiar with feral animals, but um, <laughs> it's uh, feral animals, not just cats, but ungulates, uh, including deer, pigs, um, in some cases sheep, are a huge problem throughout Hawaii. Um, they're non native, but they've been here for a long time. There's a strong and vocal hunting um, a g lobby here. You know, folks like to hunt here. And so, um, you know, there's tension between conservation and hunting in the same way that there is between fishing and conservation in some ways. And, um, you know, I, I, would, I would just say using the allegory of the invasive lemu, the invasive algae was in the bay, that was, again, largely believed to be an impossible problem to solve. Um, but we look at the multiple stressors on the bay, I think there's a high degree of capacity to address those things. And the key thing is, is how do we get there? for each one of those things. And for the Limu problem, it was attacked with a very focal, uh, focal plan that Nature Conservancy and Malama Manalua developed and brought in other partners to try to ameliorate. And I think that for any individual stressor, stressor if it's feral animals or if it's land-based pollution from another source, 
those have to be attacked in the same way systematically with the right amount of capital and resources and partnerships. My name is Jim Romig. I'm a resident of the Bay. Uh, are there any plans to continue with the removal of the invasive algae? I guess that's mine. That's you, man. Yes. <laughs> um, that, uh, that's a difficult one for, for me to answer. I mean, I would, I would defer that over to Layton, but um, my, my understanding is there is, and Layton just shouted out yes uh, towards me. Yeah. The specifics of those plans, um, do, you, do you have anything? Well, a major initiative of Malama Monlua is to continue the invasive algae uh, removal and monitoring programs. As I said, uh, I mentioned, I think, but you might not have caught it, that Duane uh, has designed a protocol uh, for volunteers, some of whom are trained scientists and the rest uh, are being trained <laughs> in the field, to measure the effects uh, of the removals to see whether the algae is growing back, how much it's coming, if it is coming, where it's coming, to, to monitor those efforts to make sure what we're doing is effective and that our efforts are put into in the right areas. Uh, we are committed right now, to, I think, to doing at least uh, two major community hookies a month, and that usually involves uh, 50 to sometimes 100 students or community people. Uh, and Jim, you've been out there. You're one of the volunteers. We're going to keep depending on you to come out. Um, so the answer is that Malama Monlua is dedicated to um, continuing the um, removal of the algae and monitoring how we're doing because we think without a lot, uh, we think that that algae created a tipping point where the bay got into really bad shape and now we by Helping reverse that, we're going to climb back up the, the graph into the good place. How many in the audience have uh, been involved in a hooky and the Pico Reef area? I bet but just about every hand will go. Well, those of you who have not raised your hand, you're really missing something. It's not only rewarding, uh, but it's fun, and you learn a lot and meet some great people. So keep your eye on the Malama Monlua website, and uh, there's always an opportunity to come out. We do have a new plan uh, that's dedicated to one of our longtime volunteers who passed away suddenly, uh, called an Adopt-a-Plot plan. Uh, we have plots uh, mapped uh, by satellite. Um, not our satellite, but Google satellite or whoever owns the satellite, um, DOD, I guess. Anyway, we've mapped every plot out there so we can measure uh, what's going on in each plot. And some of the plots need more help than others. And so uh, Kenny Gleason, who started the program, actually would go out and um, devote time on uh, selected plots and making sure they were clear. Uh, now, in his honor, we've started a program called Adopt-a-Plot Program, where, where people can uh, adopt their plot, come out, and pull the algae, or uh, <laughs> have their friends pull it for them, however they want to do it. But uh, I urge you to uh, look up that program on the website, too. Jack, could you please describe how community-based fisheries management would work, could work in this bay? So there's several, I guess, policy mechanisms for that. The, um, the one that Haena, which was Brad mentioned, and I think um, Dwayne Ka mentioned it too, and Kaupulehu, which is in the in Kona area, uh, have used slightly different mechanisms. Uh, the one that Haena has used is called the Community-Based Subsistence Fishing Area designation, which is a state designation that communities can, um, can go for. Uh, Kaupulehu is using their fisheries replenishment area. These are just designations that the state has. Um, but they all have one kind of common nucleation point, and that's that it allows the community to draft and develop the rules that are implemented in the place. Now that's the important part because that's absolutely what's on the table for Mauna Lua Bay, which is that uh, if we decide collectively as a community to revise the fishing rules or any kinds of rules for that matter, um, that there are existing policy mechanisms 
to uh, push a plan into actual practice and have it be adopted by the state. And that's really what we call co-management because it's management by the community together with state and federal agencies. And, um, and that's actually proven to have a lot of success biologically and socially, not just here in Hawaii, but globally. There's kind of a global movement that's pushing basically towards decentralization of management which is allowing local groups to manage more actively. And uh, again, that of course has a long historical record and um, traditional practice here. So it's also much more congruent with um, you know, community-based management. So uh, I won't get into the nitty gritty details of how the policy works because that really is boring. It is difficult. It's a long road. Um, we have had for the past four years uh, uh, a, a much more supportive group of state leaders in the DLNR, including in the federal government, like Malia and the Sanctuary Program, um, that have been advocates for this pathway and therefore communities have been emboldened to pursue it. Um, we all hope and, and we all think that uh, Governor Ige will be supportive of this route too. We really don't know, but we certainly hope so. And, um, you know, that'll depend on uh, the DLNR and the cabinet positions that EGA appoints, and, but we all feel very emboldened to work with whoever's there um, and, and to be able to support communities across the archipelago, including this one. More questions? Actually, can I just add something really quickly to that question? Sure. One, of, one of the key, um, key pieces of, of getting the community uh, sort of fishing regulations or management areas into place is is a, a high level of consensus within the community itself. And that's, that I think is where the real challenge will be in, in Monolua Bay, um, because it is a very large and very diverse community. Um, and so it is extremely important um, that uh, Malama Monolua, as well as all, you've, all the other partners who are working on, uh, on this plan, uh, do a lot of outreach with the community, work with the community, bring all of the stakeholders into the process. Because the first thing that'll get asked at the state level is, uh, you know, to, 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 is this what the community really wants? Um, and so it's important that all of the members of the community are, are involved in that process. Um, and that's one of the reasons it is a, a long, long and hard road. But, um, you know, I think that there is a lot of drive in this community. Um, and I, I think this community can do it if they set their mind to it. Uh, so I guess it's kind of a two-part question. Um, I guess the first part is like what do we know like the baseline for the ecosystems out here as far as um, like what it was before all the invasive algae was or got here and then I guess the second part for that would be uh, like once once all the algae is gone are they going to replace it with something because like the way I kind of see it is once it's gone something else is going to take its place. Um, that's what it usually ends up happening in most ecosystems. So, I mean, the the ecosystem's been so changed from what it used to be as far as streams being blocked or springs out there. I mean, there's still springs out there, but you won't see as many. I mean, you definitely won't see any horses drinking out of the water anymore. So, uh, like, what's the plan? Are we going to try to get it back to the baseline or is it are we just going to let it change and hope for the best uh yeah um that's a really good question um in conservation i i think people always struggle with what what do they want something to be like um you know what is the baseline that you're trying to get back to um and i, I don't think there is a right or a wrong answer to that particular question. Um, that's why I think it's important when you set out is to describe is to describe what your um, what your target is. You know what are you trying to get to? Um, the chances of us going back to way to the way Hawaii was pre-contact is is probably not going to happen. Um, so is that a baseline you set? Well, you could, but it's not realistic. Um, in, in the case of uh, of the algae removal, at least down in the Pico area, uh, the the target was to have native algae re return to the area. 
um, because there was a perception that uh, this invasive algae had moved in and had basically taken over 100 percent of, of what was there. Um, that turned out not to be quite true, um, but there was a heck of a lot of invasive algae there. Um, when it, it, it's been removed and um, some of it is growing back uh, and the community hookies go out and they're attempting to continue to control it. Uh, but there are areas that have been cleared that have converted back over into native algae and native seagrass. Uh, Malama, uh, Manalua Bay used to have incredible seagrass beds. Um, there's actually a native Hawaiian seagrass, which most people don't even notice. It's about, it's like this tall. Um, it's, it's a beautiful little green bladed seagrass. Um, but it basically disappeared from the Pico area uh, when the invasive algae came in. And um, you can now find it in a lot of areas. And um, I, I know the community monitoring team, which laid in this part of, runs into it frequently now. Um, we, we've run into it frequently at this point. Um, the native diversity is up in the area, so there are more native algae. The native cover of algae is up. Uh, so these are the types of things that have moved, moved into uh, the areas where, where, where they've been successful in getting the algae out. Um, in some areas, it seem, the invasive algae seems to be growing back. Um, and so the hope is, is if you keep pulling it out, eventually you will get it out of that area and the natives can move in and hold it. Um, one feature of a lot of native ecosystems is is if they're intact, they tend to be pretty resilient. Um, and uh, you see this in rainforests, for example. If you have a rainforest that's all nicely grown together, invasive plants can't get into it. Um, but the second you go in and tear down some trees or cut down some trees, the invasives get a foothold into it, and then from there they, they can spread through. Uh, and so that's kind of the hope of, of what, what they'll see on, uh, on the reflat. Add one thing. You, your second question was, "What would we like to see as a you know target?" And um, I mean, I've got my personal kind of you know what I'd like to see. As Dwayne said, we all have our own baseline, but it's you. Do you fish or or, or dive or something out here? So, so your opinion about what this bay should look like is just as important as anyone's. And it's that conversation that we all need to have. You know, we need to put those things out there and see if we can agree upon a path to get there. And um, like Dwayne said, that's a hard thing to do. But I think, you know, as Brad said in his comments about um, the cultural value of the place and the melding of science, conservation, and culture, that's been part of um, all the programs that, quite honestly, have gone on in this bay. And I think it'll be an important part of it moving forward. But we're all going to have to put our kind of values on the table and kind of scope out a path forward if we want to get those bars off the left side of Dwayne's graph. Right. Um, I, I guess the question's going to be directed to um, Dwayne, um, where, where have all the fish gone? Um, uh, and I'll, I'll ramble a little bit, but hopefully not too much. Um, what, one of the points you made was some of the gains um, were beyond the reef. It's the way the community has um, gotten involved um, the last five or six years, and I, and I think that's, um, that's real exciting. Um, right now, I have, you might say, tunnel vision. Uh, when I used to surf, I, I didn't look at the area between the beach um, and the breakers. I, I just looked at the breakers. Now I, I like to fish for bonefish, so I, I actually don't see the waves anymore. I look at the tide and I look for little shiny fins sticking out of the water. Um, what, what I have noticed, and again, I'm learning and that's why I'm kind of here, is when the invasive seaweed um, was removed, um, there was a tremendous decrease in the bonefish population from Niwiki Peninsula um, and to uh, Pico Lagoon. And right now, although the water is very pristine and the sand is real white, um, the fish that I was fishing for um, are not feeding in that area. And I remember um, a YouTube video of um, Governor Neil Abercrombie pick, pulling out the invasive seaweed, shaking out the little crabs and, and, and critters, you know, and then, of course, the invasive seaweed was disposed of. But I think, a, 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 I guess, a, one, when one thinks about it, realizes that when you drop those uh, shrimp and crabs down into the bare sand, um, the OEO um, were quite happy because um, there was no hiding place for them. So they were in heaven. They, they fed and they got fat and they, they were excited. But now the habitat for the crustaceans is gone um, and the um, food source for the um, OEO it no longer exists. So they tend to travel across the sand flats but not feed on them. 
And so that kind of um, uh, concerns me. Um, as a landscape contractor, I hear a lot of talk about um, native plants. Um, although what I've seen on the land may not apply to the ocean, but to, to be brief, um, at, at Diamond Head, a couple of hundred thousand dollars was spent planting native plants. They've all died. Um, across the street um, on Hind Drive, there's a, a rock um, that used to be surrounded by native plants. That was a $60,000 project. At Makapu Lighthouse, $300,000 were used to plant native plants. So in all of those areas, the invasives, once the enthusiasm of the community or the funds ran out, um, the, in, the invasives basically came back. And so I, I, I'm concerned that, um, again, when I see a client pulling plants out of their yard and not having a plan to put them in and not realizing that to plant things usually costs about 10 times as much as removing things, um, the projects sometimes are destined to fail. But to, 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 to tighten it up a little bit, um, uh, I'm concerned that in that there's not a lot of fresh water going into the bay, that there's, I guess, 60,000 people that live in the area. There, there are definitely pollutants going into the bay. Um, uh, plants tend to mitigate pollutants, and so I'm wondering if the mudweed was, in fact, maybe um, granted a nasty uh, plant, but it may have mitigated some of the nitrates that were running off uh, from the ocean and they uh, from the from the land, and it, and they definitely did provide habitat for the crustaceans, and the oeo, which is an endemic fish, was quite happy. So um, now that the mudweed's gone. Um, my OEO are not there anymore, and so I'm kind of disappointed. Um, are you looking at adverse, of, I guess, both sides of the coin? You know, the, um, and anyway, please, uh, thank you. Sure, sure. Um, you, you definitely ranged through a whole lot of topics here, so um, I'm going to try and, and hit as many of those as I can, but, but forgive me if I, if I don't quite hit them all. Um, uh, your, your first question about, uh, about the OEO. Um, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I, I mean, I'm not going to question your perception of what's going on out there. Uh, you're out there every day. I'm not. Um, okay. But, but that's eight hours more a week than, than I'm out there uh, at this point. Um, I can say that immediately following the removal, um, there, was, uh, there was a lot of talking done with the community and with um, uh, OEO fishermen. Uh, and the perception at that point was that uh, some fishermen thought the OEO were less common there and others did not. Um, the, the majority of the fishermen who were spoken to um, actually thought that the OEO fishing was a little better at that point. Now whether that's changed in the three or four years since the project has been done, I, I, I don't know, which is, which is why I would, I would say I'm, I'm very interested in your observations out there. Um, at, as to the food, we, we did actually look at the food. Um, and we did uh, some, some gut content work on OEO. Um, we had a gentleman come in from the Bishop Museum who's an expert in looking at those small crustaceans. And he looked at the small crustaceans in, uh, growing in the mudweed and the small crustaceans that grow in patches of native algae. And he actually found that, that they grew in the, basically the same amounts uh, in both of those. So, so we were fairly confident if, if we could turn that area back over into native algae uh, the primary, one of the primary food sources for OEO would be maintained in the area. Now, of course, that means it's got to turn over. Uh, it, it stayed um, fairly bare for a long time after we pulled the algae out. It took, oh, probably 18 months or so um, after the removal, and then you started seeing some stuff grow back. Um, that was actually a really big surprise, um, because most people believe algae grows back really quickly. Um, a year and a half is a long time. Um, but in those bare patches, the, the amount of crustaceans in those patches is actually quite a bit lower than what's in the algae. Um, as, as to the effect of the native or the invasive algae on the reef and whether it's you know, providing some filtering, um, it, that particular native algae, the, the mudweed, um, was a very, very good trapper. Um, it's, it's actually what, what, um, what you might call an ecosystem engineer. It goes out and actively changes the environment into something more favorable to itself. 
Uh, and what that what that stuff did is it would uh, it grow out, get into a kind of a muddy patch that other plate that other native algae didn't like, and then it would slow the water movement down and just trap more mud and trap more mud and trap more mud, and that would allow it to to, to spread. Um, at at the point when it was removed, the that algae was so thick out there that the low tide on the inside of the algae, the shoreward side of the algae, was actually offset by, I think it was something like an hour and a half from the tide on the outside because it trapped so much water in there and it took so long for that water to drain through the algae that the, that, that the tide was actually offset in those areas um, as a result of, of the algae. So, so yeah, it definitely is trapping a whole bunch of sediment. Um, a lot of that sediment does hold nutrients. Um, fortunately, we had the uh, U.S. Geological Survey come in and take, take a look at what happens to that sediment um, as it moves across the reef. Uh, and what they showed was that once that sediment gets over the reef crest, um, the currents in Monolua Bay are such that it actually sweeps it um, into basically the abyssal waters um, offshore, um, thousands of feet of water. Uh, so those sediment that are clearing off the reef flat um, even after we removed the Avernvillia, uh, once it got over the reef crest, those, those were taken out. Uh, and and there's, there's no evidence that those are actually staying up in the bay in the shallower areas. Um, those are winding up in very, very deep water. So, so my fishing will improve, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fishing is always going to improve all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you know, that's... Uh, that, that's a question I can't promise one way or the other. Um, I would certainly hope fishing would improve. There are a lot of things that can be done to improve fishing. I mean, we've, we've talked about several of those. Um, I, I would like to think if, if the uh, algae clearing um, caused a dip in OEO, as that area continues to, con continues to recover and the amount of native algae that continues to grow back in there, um, that, that if it is in that dip, it'll come back out of that dip. And hopefully you'll, hopefully you'll start catching more OEO. Um, I, I mean, I realize part of fishing is the hunt, um, yeah. but the satisfaction is the catch. So hopefully you'll, you'll continue to get some Let, catch. Thank you very much. Um, there, there was a lot of discussion about enforcement. And you know, with the iPhones now, um, it would be nice if we, we as fishermen, or those of us that are in the water or are concerned about the bay, uh, might get some support as far as legislation so that um, a photograph um, that I've taken on a regular basis of people either fishing in the Piper Lagoon Wildlife Sanctuary or using throw nets with Port Rich Eye or doing other illegal activities could be used to, you know, uh, for the Department of Land Management to enforce some of the laws. So Doe Care does a workshop on, um, on that. And, and they are, you know, there is the Mackay Watch program of which Mauna Loa has one. Um, in our fishing survey, I didn't present it in this talk, but um, something like a third or so, I have to go back and look, of folks were documenting illegal fishing activity on their own and then s giving that to Doe Care for possible um, infractions. Uh, we know enforcement's an issue, uh, I think, as a community of folks involved in the conservation of the bay. And there's some models out there that we're looking at to increase it, not just only the Mackay Watch model and what that can offer, but um, you know the Community Fisheries Enforcement Unit model uh, that, that my organization, CI, piloted over in Maui, and that's got a 96% compliance rate in their patrol area. Uh, it's not cheap, but it works. So um, it, that in, effective enforcement is the backbone of any basic plan because it, the rules, if the rules aren't enforced, then the greatest rules in the world won't have an effect. Okay, we have one final question here. Hi, good evening. Um, it seems like a lot of data has been collected um, so that we have information to work with, but I'm curious as to what will be the process from here on and how do we get involved. Uh, for example, you recognize that um, harvesting fish is appears to be the major factor in the lesser counts of fish. Um, at, since you have the data, are you going to go to the state and see if we can get the state to put in regulations to address this uh, to help conserve more of the targeted fish? Or are you going to continue to collect data until you have enough to write one big report and then submit it uh, as one big package rather than as piecemeal as data to support action becomes available? and. 
either way that you go, can you give us an idea of when you see this happening, when these, this data will be applied towards uh, initiating changes? Okay. Alan, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I'll let other people answer for themselves. But I, we're, we're all in this together. It's not like we're going to, me as an independent scientist, or I imagine Dwayne or anybody is going to finally get to a point where we're like, it's incontrovertible. We need a new management plan. We, we're all in this together. We're all part of the community, and we've got to, you know, we've got to pull together to move forward with it. And so um, I, I'm not trying to be overly vague. I just think we've had a couple questions where people said, oh, you know, what are you guys going to do? And it's not us. It's all of us. It's the community's got to do this together. And I think that um, especially with the experience that you have and that other communities have in the, in the, in the area, we've got to pull together at that. And that, you know, it's almost a question for Malama Monalua than it is for the supporting partners. <laughs> Malama Monalua uh, has a strong uh, strategic initiative to help lead and develop a plan that would bring together the community and their needs and wants and with the data that we need and hear from people whether their particular problem is the feral cats or uh, they're using the wrong fly for OEO or whatever it is. We'll get all of that stuff together, and uh, it will be a community plan. It will not be a fiat. Uh, it will be developed by the community. But as we said earlier, the more diverse the community, maybe the healthier it is, but also the more diverse, the more difficult to reach accord. So we're going to have a couple of years of hard work, or less, I hope, to develop such a plan which can then um, bring us to the better destination of a better bay. So it's uh, n almost 9 o'clock, and I wanted to thank our speakers tonight very much for coming. <laughs> and for their, their, their fine presentations. And when you thank a speaker, of course, you're not just thanking them for the 20 minutes they talked. You're thanking them for the years of work that they put in out in the field, wet, dry, cold, warm. Uh, and all of that boring time writing uh, grant proposals. And so our thanks are much deeper than just for tonight, believe me. And thanks to all of you for coming out again on a Saturday night uh, in December. Uh, I hope it was worth your while. It was certainly worth my while. And thank you very much for coming. Good night.